Okay, we're going to start on chapter six here and talk about the three dimensional structure of proteins. So we've got a lot to cover. I'll try to go a little bit faster, uh, not drone on as much, but these are the topics that we'll cover in this section. And of course, the key concepts you can find at the first of the chapter in the book. But let's talk a little bit about the comparison between proteins and DNA. So as of the 29th of May, there's 164,391 protein structures in the PDB, which stands for the Protein Data Bank. So now DNA has a very predictable structure, double-stranded helix uh, that doesn't depend much on the sequence, meaning the different bases that you have. Protein shapes are very dependent on the sequence and are extremely diverse. So there are uh, there is some order that can be found. So many structures have homologous domains with homologous folds that we'll talk about. We can classify these folds into larger families. And these within folds are repeating kind of backbone structures. So there is some repetition here and some commonalities, but we have a lot more pieces. We've got 20 amino acids, and so the variability that we can get in comparison to DNA is quite large. So the last chapter that we talked about, we uh, discussed just the sequence of amino acids, and that's what's referred to as the primary sequence, or the primary structure. So primary structure is what we discussed in chapter five. And now there's three additional levels of organization, the secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. And so you can see that diagram here. So the secondary structure that we'll talk about first is how the amino acid sequence folds up into some organized uh, structures. And there'll be preliminary, primarily two of those, alpha helices and beta sheets. And then we'll look at the tertiary structure where we get one complete uh, polypeptide chain and how it folds up. And then finally, quaternary structures, which is not found in all proteins, which is when you get separate polypeptide chains that associate with each other. And again, we're gonna discuss each one of those in detail. And here's just another scheme uh, that you can see that relates the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. So like most organic polymers, protein molecules adopt a specific three-dimensional conformation. And this is very important. This is what gives rise to the protein's structure and function is the three-dimensional arrangement of those amino acids. And the structure is able to fulfill a specific biological function. Like I said, it could be an enzyme which is involved in catalysis or a structural protein or a signaling molecule. And this structure is called the native fold. The native fold has a large number of favorable interactions. So in order for it to actually form its three-dimensional shape, there must be some favorable interactions. But there's also an entropy cost as you start to organize this floppy chain into organized regions, you pay somewhat of a entropy cost. So we need to talk about those things as we go through this chapter. And Here's another example, and uh, we're gonna be talking about each one of these. So you should definitely know the difference between primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. And we'll go through each one of those in detail. Now, a lot of this structure comes uh, from the nature of the peptide bond. So the peptide bond actually has a significant amount of resonance from the lone pair of the nitrogen onto that carbonyl. And so you can see the two different resonance structures there. You can see that in one, it shows a sigma bond in between the nitrogen and the carbonyl. And the following one, there is a double bond between there. Now, if you remember, resonance structures aren't really real, but they do 
give insight into the true nature. And so that uh, NC double bond O is shorter than what you'd find in a typical amine, a carbon bond. So we do know that there is some donation in between there that has some double bond character. Uh, books give estimates of about 40% bond character. And what we need to know is that that double bond character there restricts the rotation around that. And essentially you're planar around that carbonyl nitrogen amide bond there. And so you can see some uh, values around this little diagram in the bottom right, such as the bond angles and the peptide bond. And again, these differ from what you would see in a typical just amine carbon bond. And so the take home message from this is that in order to understand proteins, we need to realize that this bond between the nitrogen and the carbonyl is special and essentially makes it rigid around those atoms. Now, since we're going to be rigid around this bond here, you may think that the entire molecule is somewhat flat. Well, that's not quite true because we do have the ability to rotate and we can rotate around this nitrogen C alpha bond and the C alpha carbonyl bond right there. And so that is the uh, this bond right here is restricted and flat, uh, but it, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, being flat, it can adopt two different conformations, just like an alkene. And so it could adopt the trans double bond like structure, or it could adopt the cis double bond. And as you can imagine, the trans double bond is much, much more stable, about eight kilojoules per mole, more stable in the trans. When you put it in the cis, just like you have in a cis double bond, you start getting sterically, steric clashes among those groups on the same side. And so uh, you do find the cis double bonds in some places, uh, but by the vast majority, the peptide bond is gonna be found in the trans conformation. There is one amino acid that you'll find in the cis conformation and that's proline. And proline has this rigid five membered ring. So remember it goes from the C alpha right here and it back bonds into that nitrogen there. And so in doing so, uh, it has some limited rotation and it can adopt the cis conformation. In fact, you'll find it around 10% of the time in proteins in the cis conformation. And the reason for that is either way, it's gonna have steric clashes. So since here's the C alpha and it's bonding to that nitrogen, you're gonna have these groups here that are gonna clash in even when it's in the trans conformation or you'll have those clash when it's in the cis conformation. So we're gonna see the proline plays an important structural role in proteins, and that's due to its restricted conformation and kind of its bulky arrangement of atoms and the inclusion of atoms off of this nitrogen right there. So, like I said, around the peptide bond, those can be viewed as planar, they typically appear in the trans conformation, meaning the carbonyl and the H off of the nitrogen are in opposite directions. But we do have the side chains here. And as I mentioned, we do get some rotation around those bonds right there. So we're not gonna get rotation around the nitrogen carbonyl bonds, but we are going to get uh, rotations if we focus on the C alpha, we can get rotations around the C alpha to the amino bond or the amine or the nitrogen bond and from the C alpha to the carbonyl bond. 
And so we have a name for each one of these. They're the phi and the psi angle. The phi is from the C alpha to the nitrogen, and the psi is from the C alpha to the carbonyl carbon. And so you can actually uh, determine that angle between there. So in this case, we're looking down the nitrogen C alpha bond. And when you look down the nitrogen C alpha bond right here, the groups that you're going to look at the angle are the carbonyl carbons. And so you can actually determine those angles and you can look down the C alpha to the carbonyl bond. And when you look down the C alpha to the carbonyl bond, it's going to be the nitrogens that you're looking at the angle between there. So this is like conformational analysis in organic chemistry when we did Newman projections. And you can determine these phi and psi angles. And so phi is the rotation around the nitrogen C alpha bond and the angle, like I mentioned, if we're looking down the nitrogen C alpha bond here, and actually the proper way is to look down the alpha to the nitrogen direction. And when you do that, what you're looking at is this carbonyl carbon and this carbonyl carbon, the angle between those. And then you have the psi angle, which is looking down the C alpha to the carbonyl bond here. And when you look at that angle, you're looking at the angle between these nitrogens here. So by convention, both angles, when they're fully extended in the trans conformation, are 180 degrees. And both angles increase when the peptide bond is rotated clockwise when we look down the C alpha bond. Now, this is kind of hard to see, but there's a great website right down here. So if you navigate to that website right there, you'll be able to change the phi and psi angle and see why the trans is more stable. You'll see when clashes come in. And so I encourage you to actually go to that website right there and play around with the phi and psi angles. So someone else has spent time playing around with the phi and psi angles, and that was Ramachandran. And Ramachandran came up with a diagram that shows forbidden and allowed. And uh, it should be that they're forbidden. A better term would be unfavorable and favorable combinations. And so if we look at these angles here, and again, where this comes up is here's your uh, phi and psi angles. And what they did is essentially just rotated all possible combinations around there and looked at when you get steric clashes. And when you get steric clashes, that would go into a region here that would be, like it says, forbidden or unfavorable. And these in green are the favorable angles, or sorry, uh, yeah, within the green and the blue, they're favorable. Within blue, they're always allowed. These are the really favorable angles. And so you can see that is with a phi angle in the negative 80s to negative 170s, and the psi angles between 90 and 180. And then you can see there's some other regions down here. And there's a region out here. So you don't necessarily need to be able to replicate this, but understand what it's showing is that all they did was just go and rotate around these bonds here and figure out when things are not really sterically clashing. And so there's a couple regions in here in the yellow circles. So the alpha indicates uh, the angles that you get in an alpha helix that we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, the arrows pointing in the same directions, a parallel beta sheet, and then arrows in opposite directions, the anti-parallel uh, beta sheet. Uh, the region C, those are the angles that you get in collagen that we'll talk about. And then the alpha L is a left-handed alpha helix. So this is a plot for uh, most amino acids. Proline actually has a different uh, Ramachandran plot. It's limited to its phi angles to around negative 60 degrees. So its angles are going to be uh, around here. 
And glycine has more available conformations. Uh, if you remember glycine, it only has two H's on its backbone. And so it doesn't nearly have the restriction and the steric interactions that the other amino acids have. So this will make more sense as we start to look at secondary uh, structures. But just understand what a Rasham, Rasham, Rush, oh my goodness, it's really, Ramachandran, there we go. Ramachandran diagram is showing the allowed phi and psi angles. And just to uh, understand what portions of the amino backbone can actually rotate and which ones can't rotate. And so let's jump into our first secondary structure. This is known as the alpha helice, named alpha because it was the first secondary structure that was found. Linus Pauling was the one that came up with this uh, model. It was later proven true by X-ray crystallography and other methods. And it's referred to as a regular secondary structure that are common in proteins. Regular because it's composed of sequences with repeating phi and psi angles, meaning that every amino acid has common phi and psi angles. And common because almost every protein is largely, largely composed of one or both of these structures. So the first one that we're looking at again is the alpha helice. And it's stabilized by hydrogen bonding between the backbone residue. And the beta sheet that we'll talk about is stabilized also by hydrogen bonds between adjacent segments. And those adjacent segments may not be nearby. So if we look a little bit more at the alpha helice, uh, it has this helical backbone. It's a right-handed helix. And the distance between this nitrogen, and there's a hydrogen off of here, and the carbonyl carbon that it's hydrogen bonding to is 2.8 angstroms, which is uh, very optimal. So the hydrogen bonds are almost perfectly straight, which is a good arrangement for hydrogen bonds. Uh, it is a right-handed helix, like I mentioned, with 3.6 residues per turn. And it rises 5.8 angstroms per turn. So as you go around, uh, as you go through one complete turn from here to here, you're going to cover 3.6 angstroms. And that's important. So uh, what you need to do is you need to add an additional carbonyl. You, you couldn't have an uh, integer number because then the hydrogen bonds wouldn't line up. So you notice that the nitrogen of one needs to line up with the carbonyl of another. So that's why it's not an integer value. So 3.6 residues per turn. Uh, the side chains on this actually point outwards from the helix. The interior of the helix ends up being very tightly crowded and the atoms are in van der Waals contacts there. But the R groups, the side chains are actually pointing outwards. Okay, now you don't need to know these numbers, but uh, we did talk about them having regular phi and psi angles. And so in this amino acid, uh, or sorry, yeah, the secondary structure here, the amino acids have phi and psi angles that you can see at negative 64 degrees and negative 41 degrees, plus or minus seven degrees. So they don't deviate much from their phi and psi angles. So they have a very regular arrangement of the groups around that amino acid backbone there. Uh, like I mentioned, it was discovered by Linus Pauling in 1951, uh, mainly just through modeling. The story I heard is that uh, the box talks a little bit about this, but he was sick. He, so essentially was in quarantine and he had a little strip of paper and it had a primary sequence on there and he was trying to figure out how it could fold up into, into a structure. This is actually before DNA was, uh, the structure of DNA was discovered. I don't know if they were still thinking proteins might have had genetic information in there, but uh, they were just starting to get the structural information about biomolecules. And the story that I heard was that he was walking down the stairs and around the house and he just had this uh, amino acid sequence on a piece of paper. Kind of absentmindedly, he just twisted it around itself 
and lo and behold, when he did that, he saw that the carbonyl and the hydrogen off of a nitrogen could hydrogen bond. And he just noticed that he could make it so that uh, every fourth residue would hydrogen bond with the residue for amino acids before it. So here is a more space filling model here. And you can see that the carbons are in green of the backbone and the nitrogen's blue and the oxygen's red. And you can see that that's very well packed on the interior. And then the gold are the side chains and they point outward, but the helicy in here of the backbone is actually very, very tightly packed and very organized. Okay, so spend some time uh, getting to know your alpha helicy. And let's talk about the second one, also discovered by Pauling and Robert Corey. And these are referred to as beta sheets. And they have, again, regular phi and psi angles there. And there's two different ways that you can do this. You can do this in anti-parallel. And what that means is that we run from N carbonyl alpha, and carbonyl alpha, and then the other strand runs opposite from carbonyl and alpha, carbonyl and alpha. So these are running in opposite directions. You can see in this case, it's running, the N to C is running this direction, and the N terminus to the C terminus is running in this direction. And you see in doing that, the, you get these nice hydrogen bond patterns as well. And then you can have parallel, where they're both running in the same direction. So N terminus is C terminus here. And again, you get hydrogen bonding between the strands. But again, uh, in this case, the hydrogen bonds aren't nearly as well aligned. So in this case, the strands are almost fully extended. You get the hydrogen bonding between strands. And they can exist in this parallel or anti-parallel. And the anti-parallel, like I mentioned, actually have the more ideal hydrogen bonding there. So the beta sheets, uh, they can have anywhere between two and 12 strands are known. And six strands is about average for the beta sheets. As we mentioned, the anti-parallel sheets are more stable because the hydrogen bonds align better. But you'll see uh, mixtures of sheets with parallel and anti-parallel. Those are common. Uh, the peptide backbone of the beta strand is almost fully extended, but not completely. So it actually leads to a little bit of a pucker as you go up and down the backbone here. So these were commonly referred to as beta pleated sheets when I first went through biochemistry. It seems like they don't throw the pleated in there as much. The book does mention that, so beta pleated sheets or beta strands, beta sheets. And you notice that the side chains alternate uh, which side of the sheet that they are pointing towards. So this one is pointing this direction, that one's pointing that direction, and that one's pointing that direction. So the side chains point up above or below the beta pleated sheet. Okay, so here is an example of these beta sheets. Uh, up here in the top, you can see that we have an anti-parallel strand. Again, you can tell because I'm going from a carbonyl nitrogen alpha, and here I'm going from a carbonyl alpha nitrogen. So this is an anti-parallel strand. You can also see that when you do that, the hydrogen bonds line up very nicely. Uh, this one's showing the pleat in there, and you can see that this R group is pointing out at you, and this R group would be pointing back underneath the sheet. And so when you make these sheets, they tend to kind of have a right-handed twist, but here is an overall protein. And uh, to illustrate these structures, they use just these ribbon diagrams. They don't show the side chains, uh, they just show the backbone. And so when you get these strands that are aligned like this, you know that it's a beta sheet. And of course, if you saw these ribbons here, 
you can see that that's an alpha helice there. And often proteins will contain both alpha helices and beta sheets. So those are our two typical or regular uh, secondary structures. Just a little bit more about the, the beta strands, how you actually get them. So you can see off to the left, if we have an anti-parallel, uh, you can go one direction, make a short turn, and then come back, and that would put you in an anti-parallel. If you're in a parallel strand, you're actually going to need some way to get that to line up in the same direction. So you need some type of loop. And often that loop could be an alpha helice here. And you can see that in uh, this direction, a little bit hard, but here's one beta sheet and it comes out. Oh, I lost it, sorry. There's the beta sheet and it comes out and then there's an alpha helice that connects it to another beta sheet. So these are, uh, running in parallel. Actually, in this case here, sorry, this is anti-parallel here. Uh, but somewhere in here, if you look, there is a parallel. Actually, I think it's this back coil that connects. And again, you can have this alpha helice here. So this is what's known as a beta alpha beta motif that we'll talk about in just a second. But before we talk about that, we just need to understand how you can get these turns. So those sharp turns, they're referred to as beta turns, and they occur frequently when one strand of a beta sheet changes direction. And essentially the turn is 180 degrees, and it's accomplished over four amino acids. And this turn is actually stabilized by hydrogen bonding from a carbonyl oxygen to an amide proton, uh, three residues down the sequence. And they have two different types, type one and type two. Don't worry about being able to distinguish them, but uh, it has to do with the configuration around this uh, bond right here, which is really has to do with the rotation around here. So if you notice, this carbon comes out to that nitrogen there, and this carbon comes out to that nitrogen there. So it really just has to do with the rotation around these bonds. So don't worry too much about type one and type two. Understand what a beta turn is, and that is where a flip in these uh, beta strands occurs, takes up four residues. And what's really interesting is this C alpha here, you need a very small side chain uh, to accommodate uh, this turn here. And so uh, typically, residue two is a glycine, and then you need something to make it bend. And so this one right here is a glycine, or sorry, not glycine, a proline residue. So the proline residue here, remember it has restricted conformation and can add this little kink and bend in there. So these turns are often a glycine, uh, Oh, sorry, I had that backwards. Sorry. Too early in the morning. I should just read. Residue two is the proline. Here we go. So here's the proline, and that makes more sense. So the proline is going to add a kink in it, and when we have the kink, the following amino acid needs to be small to accommodate that kink. And so then we would follow that up with a glycine right there. So residue two is often a proline, and then residue three is often a glycine to accommodate that kink caused by the proline. So prolines aren't typically found within helices. They are actually referred to as helice breakers and uh, also beta sheet breakers. So prolines are typically found in turns and other unorganized regions. So we can actually classify uh, the protein shapes. Now this isn't just the sequence of the amino acids or secondary structure, but the overall shape. And so the two ways that we can uh, classify them that have structure are fibrous and globular. Now this came out before they really knew what proteins look like. Fibrous, they just thought were long, uh, elongated proteins and globular were just more spherical or round shaped. 
You can also have uh, random coils uh, that we'll talk about. And within these proteins, you can have mainly alpha helical or mainly beta sheet or a mixture of both. But uh, to understand the secondary structure and how it can lead to the overall protein structure, let's look at the fibrous proteins. And we're going to look at two specific ones, keratin, which is the main component of hair, horn, nails, and feathers. And this is actually a coil of alpha helices. So we take an alpha helice and we add higher structure by wrapping these alpha helices around each other. And then we'll talk about collagen, which is the most abundant vertebrate protein. And it's a major stress bearing component of bone, teeth, cartilage, tendon, fibrous matrix of skin and blood vessels. So it needs to be really strong. But collagen actually involves a different type of helix, not uh, just your alpha helix, but we'll talk about that. The key to both of these fibrous proteins is they have repeating secondary structures that make fibers. So keratin, specifically alpha keratin, is found in mammals, is a coiled coil. And what we mean by a coiled coil is it's a coil that we then coil. Amazing where these names come from. So we can see the creative name of a coiled coil. So what it is is two alpha helices that then undergo a left-handed twist around each other. Now there is a pseudo repeat, meaning that the type of amino acids repeat uh, every so often. And so it's what super is an A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And really what it is is A and D here tend to be hydrophobic residues. And then what they do is they interact with A prime and D prime over here. And so what you do is you get this hydrophobic base or nonpolar residues on the two helices interact with each other. And so you have these alpha helices here that then wrap around each other to form this bundle here or a coiled coil. So the coiled coil changes the structure of the alpha helix a bit. So one full turn is 3.5 residues instead of 3.6 and takes 5.1 angstroms instead of 4, or sorry, 5.4 angstroms. And the hydrophobic patch gently winds uh, itself around the other helice, causing them to coil gently around each other. And so you could see here that uh, these hydrophobic interactions uh, along that uh, face between the two. And you can see these structures of the alpha helices coiling around each other. So this is referred to as alpha keratin here. And uh, it doesn't just occur in alpha keratin, but this structural motif occurs in other proteins too. We'll see it when we talk about myosin, which is in the next chapter and in proteins that coil around each other to help bring membranes close together. So this is a common motif. But like I said, most commonly found in alpha keratin. Uh, yeah, so these coiled coils actually associate into larger structures. So you can take this dimer and at the end, you get these little globules here. And those interact with each other. So these N-terminal heads and C-terminal tails will interact with other N-terminal heads and C-terminal tails to get what you call a protofilament. And these uh, protofilaments, then you get, so, there's two of these. So here is the dimer, the coiled coil. You have these protofilaments, and then these protofilaments, you get four of them, and you get a microfibril. And then the microfibril will actually associate to give you a macrofibril. And in many cases, you actually get uh, disulfide bond linkages between here. And this is uh, when we talked about naturally curly hair being straightened and naturally straight hair being curled. This is where this happens is you break the disulfide bonds here mechanically 
uh, twist the hair and then get those five sulfide bonds to reform. And that is how you can actually get your hair curly or chemically straighten it. And this is due to this higher ordered structure of keratin. But uh, like I said, it's the macro fibrils that if you look under a microscope, you would see, you won't be able to see these micro fibrils. We need the macro and then anyway, several of these micro fibrils associate together to make a macro fibril. And then those macro fibrils associate together to make hair. So lots of ordered structure there. Uh, the next one that we're going to talk about is collagen. This is abundant in connective tissue, proteins, uh, matrix material, and bone on which mineral components precipitate. And this is composed of a triple strand left-handed helix there. And the collagen structure is a result of its unique sequence. So this has a really unique sequence in it. It has a repeating pattern of glycine. So you always have a glycine and then you have X where X is typically a proline. So I don't know why they don't call it a glypro and then Y. And then Y is a derivative of proline known as hydroxyproline or occasionally hydroxyglycine. And so you can see those structures there. And so you actually got two hydroxyprolines, you got four hydroxy proline and three hydroxyproline. So typically uh, the second residue is proline or could be, uh, yeah, typically proline. And then the third one is usually hydroxyproline. And so you can see that. So we got glycine, proline, and then proline, glycine, proline, and then proline. And then this, like I said, this third proline here could uh, be a hydroxy proline or occasionally a hydroxy lysine. So yeah, I don't know why they don't call it a glypro and then Y repeating unit. Uh, but this is really interesting. So you've got a glycine at every third position and this closely packs into a left-handed helix with only three residues per turn. So this is a very tight helix here. So now collagen is actually three of these left-handed helices and they form a right-handed super helix, as you can see to the right. Oh, actually you can't see that. I apologize. Can't tell, there are tons of technical errors today. It's a Monday for computers. Okay, now you should be able to see off to the right uh, these coils. So you got this really tight uh, left-handed helix and then it coils around two other helices to form a right-handed super helix there. Since each helix has three residues per turn, every third residue of each chain passes through the central axis of the superhelix chain. So what that means is each, uh, every third residue is on the interior here. Now this is very tightly coiled, so you've got to use the least sterically demanding amino acid, and that's glycine. So really only glycine can fit into that central location there. And that's why there is such a requirement that glycine appears at every third position so that you can get this tight uh, bundle of helix helices there. And then what holds these three helices together is actually hydrogen bonding from one helice to the other. Or sorry, what, anyway, yeah. You get hydrogen bonding between these helices. What holds an individual helice together is the proline uh, hydrogen bonding to the backbone of glycine. And then you get hydrogen bonding between these helices. But these are really strong fibers, so it can't just be hydrogen bonding between those helices. There has to be some more type of interactions. And we'll show you those in just a second. Uh, so here is just another example of it. You can look down, this is looking down the axis, and you can see that the interior of that is very tightly packed. So this has three helices coiling around each other. So the center of this super helix is very tightly packed. And then each one of these helices, so in blue or, and purple and 
white are also very tightly packed. And again, uh, the repeat is glycine proline and then often hydroxy proline there. So you get a very high tensile strain. Twisting the triple helix in the opposite direction from the helical strands prevents stretching. So if you've ever made rope before, what you'll take is a twisted string or a twisted uh, small rope. And then what you do is you twist it in the opposite direction around other strands. And that makes a very strong rope. Uh, and so you do this alternating opposite uh, twisting and you get a very high tensile strain. And that's how they make uh, ropes. So collagen has this property where the individual helices are left-handed, but the overall super uh, helix is right-handed there. And then these fibrils will uh, form a network of bundles. And then they're strengthened by covalent cross-linking between lysine and histidine-derived linkages. And I didn't put that picture in here. Just understand that in between these strands, you actually get some cross-linking. Now, this hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine, these amino acids back here, these aren't included on the ribosome. They are actually modified after the protein comes off. So this is what's referred to as post-translational modification. And especially this lysine right here, this is uh, this hydroxylysine is really important for the cross-linking of these collagen fibers. And the older you get, the more cross-linking you have. And so that's why aged meat tends to be tougher because the collagen in those, uh, in that meat or in those muscles tends to be a lot more cross-linked. And the filet mignon tends to be very tender because there's not a lot of cross-linking in young animals. So there are some diseases that come when you can't cross-link your collagen helices. And one of those is vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid. And so vitamin C is required for prolyl hydroxylase, the enzyme that will come along and find the proline derivatives and convert them into the hydroxy derivatives. And so that leads to a deficiency of the hydroxyproline and then you don't get the correct formation of the collagen fibers. And if you don't get correct collagen fibers, then you get skin lesions, fragile blood vessels, and wounds that don't heal, and eventually death. In fact, uh, I was reading in the book, and oh, how many was it? Um, was it Magellan's? Out of 280 people, 254 died. Uh, you can correct me on that, but anyway, the vast majority died, and most of them died from scurvy. And that's just because they didn't have fresh fruit. So it was later found out that if you ate citrus fruits, you'd get enough ascorbic acid to make your hydroxyproline, which, of course, they didn't know at the time. All they knew was if they ate citrus fruits, they wouldn't get scurvy and uh, die. So they'd send on uh, send sailors with citrus fruits, and that's why the English became known as limeys. So there's other collagen diseases, and so these arise when you can't, again, cross-link those helices, and so your collagen just doesn't uh, form properly. And so you can read about those in the book or here. So just understand that it's really important for collagen to have the proper structure, structure and the proper cross-links in order to provide uh, the strength that it needs. So those are fibrous proteins. Now, most proteins are globular with non-repetitive tertiary structures. So we need to talk about tertiary structures here. And so uh, most proteins, mixtures of ir irregular structures, loops, and random coils, and alpha helices or beta sheets. So not like uh, collagen and keratin that just are a single uh, type of structure, alpha helice. So irregular structures are usually ordered. So when we just say irregular, that just means that you just don't have a, a repeating structure. So as you can see this protein here, you can see alpha helices and beta sheets, but it doesn't look like it's, those structures are really organized there. But it does have regions of, of this secondary organization. 
and then you've got some loops and coils between the alpha helices and the beta strands. And they may have some flexibility, but tend to fold in a particular way. So loops and coils can interact with each other and with regular secondary structure elements. And what that means is just these loops here, they may look like they're just flexible, but they often are in a defined structure right there, just not one that we could classify as an alpha helice or beta sheet. Okay, so in these secondary structures, uh, different amino acids have different propensities to be found in either alpha helices and beta sheets. And so you can rank the, those propensities. So you can see in first column propensity for alpha helice, second column propensity for beta sheets. And so those are outlined in blue boxes. So the high numbers tend to be strong formers. Those are often found in alpha helices. And those in the orange boxes are strong breakers. So like we see glycine and proline are strong breakers of alpha helices. They tend to put a kink in there and cause the strand to uh, make a turn. And so you find those when you come out of an alpha helice. And then you can see residues that are strong breakers of the beta sheets and those that uh, like to form beta sheets. Okay, so sequence effects of secondary structure. So these are the things that you should be able to talk about in the secondary structure. Uh, and we're going to go and talk about the tertiary structure here. And so in tertiary structure, this is when we get larger organization of uh, the proteins. So here you can see one that we actually have a bunch of alpha helices in there. And this is the overall shape of the polypeptide chain. But the question arises, how do we know the tertiary structure of proteins? How do we know their overall shape? Well, we can use a couple of different methods, X-ray crystallography, NMR, and electron microscopy. And this helps us understand the overall three-dimensional structure of an entire polypeptide sequence. Now, uh, when we go to do NMR, it's uh, usually the uncertainty of an object is approximately equal to the wavelength of the radiation used to observe it. So if we're trying to look at the positions of atoms, we can't just use visible light. You can't look through a microscope and see atoms. So you have to use the wavelength of light that is close to the length of covalent bonds and x-rays happen to be of that length. So visible light is much, much longer wavelength, and so you can't resolve atoms. And in many cases, you can't even resolve viruses or even small bacteria using light. They're just smaller than that. And so again, the light has to be approximately equal to the feature that you're trying to observe. And so to do x-ray crystallography, you actually need a crystal of the protein. Here's just some pictures of proteins that have been crystallized. And when we think of crystals, we just want to think of a very ordered structure where everything is lined up in a specific arrangement. And if things are lined up in a specific arrangement, we can take advantage of that and use x-ray crystallography to determine their positions. And so how you do that is you have an X-ray source with collimated beams of X-rays. So collimated just means that the rays are parallel com coming in from one direction and you hit the crystal. And as those X-rays hit the crystal, since they're of the same wavelength of the atoms, uh, they get diffracted as they go through there. And so they get diffracted by the electron cloud surrounding the atoms and they, uh, bounce out at different angles. So it's uh, one way that you can think of this is if you had a fixed spot on a billiard table and you shoot those billiards at, let's just say, a post in the middle, depending where you hit that post, those balls are going to bounce off at given angles. Now, uh, it's a little bit more complex than that, uh, actually a lot more complex. Uh, 
But essentially, since you have an organized structure there, as you shine the x-rays through, they're going to diffract uh, off there and give you a specific pattern. And you record that diffraction pattern as they're deflected by the atoms in their regularly repeating positions. And that's the key is these x-rays are going to diffract, meaning be deflected from their original path. But since the atoms are in a very organized arrangement in a crystal, that deflection or that diffraction is going to be in a very repeatable sequence. And that repeatable sequence, you can use math to actually translate into where electron clouds are. And so x-rays interact with the electrons in the crystals and the electron density is presented as contour maps. So what you do is here is the diffraction pattern coming out. And if you start looking in there, you can actually start to see patterns of these dark spots. So this is where the x-rays were hitting the crystal. And as the x-rays would come in, then they'd be deflected. And again, you can see that they're deflected. It's not just uh, every possible spot is filled. Some pot spots, you see like three dark spots and then a blank spot and then another dark. And you can find these repeating patterns around here. Again, taking math that's beyond the scope of this class right now, you can actually figure out the positions of atoms or at least the electron density. And so you can see off to the right here, the electron density map, which is actually what you get from the X-ray crystallography. And then what you do, knowing the electron density around individual amino acids, you start to fit them in. So you want to see this kind of big globular electron cloud, and you're like, oh, that looks like that would fit a phenylalanine pretty well. Uh, you can trace the backbone here, and then you're like, oh, wow, off the backbone, we've got this bulge, a tumor off of it. Well, that's probably a proline that's right off the backbone here, because otherwise our backbone would be uh, fairly, fairly <clears throat> tubular, other than where a side chain pokes off there. And so there's lots of fitting, and so it really helps to know the amino acid sequence because you really don't get atomic detail out of these pictures here. And uh, a couple things just about the crystals, they tend to be 40 to 60% water. Uh, there is some movement of the protein within these crystals, so that gives rise to kind of disorder. The atoms aren't perfectly aligned, and that gives rise to the resolution limit. But there is some disorder in there. As you give this diffraction pattern, you're going to see some messiness in that. And so different crystals and the temperature that you take it at and all sorts of things will give rise to different resolution limits, meaning how much information can you get out when those x-rays are diffracted. And so you can see here along the bottom different resolutions. So this one off to the left is what you refer to as a six angstrom resolution. So you can kind of roughly see where electrons uh, are more dense, but if you didn't know the structure, it'd be really hard to fit that structure there. So then if we uh, increase the resolution down to two angstroms, you can start to see uh, higher and more regions of electron density. But finally, when we get to 1.5 angstroms, you can actually start to see the electron density around individual atoms there. And then at 1.1, uh, angstrom resolution, you can really start to see, you know, the, the fixed positions of atoms there. So it really depends on the resolution. And so how you can think of this is uh, the more ordered the crystal is, the more uh, ordered those dots are going to be in that x-ray diffraction pattern. And when you get really high order in that x-ray diffraction pattern, you can translate that into this electron density map that gives you a high confidence of where those electrons are found. So here along the bottom here is what you see electron uh, density map and you just say, wow, that looks like a big mess. But if you know the sequence of amino acids, 
you do some fitting of that sequence in there. And then you can see these bulges of electron density off of the backbone there. And uh, so you can kind of see where the backbone traces here. And then you can see where the side chains would appear. And knowing the different side chains and how much electron density and what they should look like, you can start to fit them into uh, this electron density map. And the better the electron density map, the better the structure that you'll get. So from X-ray crystallography, you can start to get 3D structures of proteins. But the question comes, well, does the crystal structure actually reflect the, pro, uh, the true structure, the solution structure of the protein? And there are a couple pieces of evidence that do suggest that protein crystals do reflect the true nature and the true structure of in-solution proteins. And one thing is that uh, patches that contact other protein molecules and crystals are fairly small. So the actual protein-protein contacts are small, so they're not really squishing together. Protein molecules and crystals are mostly hydrated. There's lots of water in between them. Now there's another technique that you can get a three-dimensional structure out of proteins, and that is referred to as the NMR. And when you compare those results, they give very similar results. So we have two different analytical techniques that give very similar three-dimensional structures. And then many enzymes are catalytic in their crystalline state. So if you take a crystal of a protein and you add in a substrate, you'll see that the crystal is actually producing product. And so that catalytic site or the active site in the protein is very sensitive to the orientation of the amino acids. So if the enzyme is actually turning over substrate, that is a very good indication that the protein is in a functional state similar to its native or solution state. Now, many proteins undergo large motion during catalysis and uh, if the protein is stuck in a crystal, often it can't undergo those large motions. And so the crystal structure may only be able to capture one state of the protein. And so to actually get the overall movement, you need to do different experiments and try to catch, uh, capture the protein in a different state as it moves during catalysis. So that is one limitation there. Okay, I'm having enough technical difficulties that I'm going to stop it here and then I'll finish up this chapter. It's also about time for office hours. So I was hoping to have the first half in one lecture, but it uh, looks like we'll break this up into three lectures and I'll get those up shortly this morning. <laughs>